Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so welcome to the last session for today, which is on applications, and I hope uh, it will be more interesting than the last session. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, our first speaker is Thomas Toft, and he will tell us about secure collaborative statistics in credit rating using linear programming. Well, thank you for the introduction. This is joint work with uh, Damgaard Nielsen and Norholt. Um, and in difference, oh, can we get some slides on the? <laughs> Did you bring them? <laughs> They're there. <laughs> there we go. All right, yeah, um, so I'll be talking about the secure uh, collaborative statistics and credit rating. Um, basically, I'm going to start from the completely other end of what we've heard today. So we've heard a lot about how to implement primitives efficiently. I'm not really going to talk a lot about uh, the inner workings of the multi-party computation. I'm starting from the completely other end of talking about people. Um, so I'll start off with uh, some banks and some farmers and tell you what we are actually what we're trying to do and then uh, give some details about what we are doing without actually going into sort of all the nitty gritty stuff at the bottom and then uh, I'll wrap up after that. All right, so um, we have a problem with dairy farmers in Denmark. Uh, dairy farmers for some reason are particularly bad for banks. Um, the problem is to actually be a suc successful farmer you need to uh, invest in a lot of things. I mean, tractors and cows and whatever. Um, you need these things to, to generate a profit. Um, but the debt to equity ratio uh, of these farmers is actually quite high, and there are some reasons for this. Partly it's because you ha we have high operational costs. So we, I mean, people have paid a lot in wages, so they have to be productive, which means you typically have to invest in machines to make them productive. Um, we've also had a pro uh, drop in the price of land since 2008, I think. From 2008 to 12, it was something like 42 percent. Um, so people have a problem with, I mean, the, the people don't really have anything that, uh, to act as collateral. Um, of course, this means that uh, it, get, it gets dangerous for banks to lend money out. Um, they do want to lend money out because if they don't lend money out, they're basically losing money. I mean, there's inflation, uh, there's cost of salaries, etc. But they're just going to lend out to anyone. They want to be repaid because if they don't get repaid, they're also losing money. Um, so, they know, so they actually have a, a pretty big problem and they, they want to do something about it. So if you look at what, we've been, what people are doing traditionally, it's uh, credit rating. So basically, it, I mean, the ability to fulfill financial commitments based on historical data, that's just a fancy way of saying, let's try to predict someone will go bankrupt. Um, if they go bankrupt, they're not going to pay us back. If they don't go bankrupt, well, that's because we have our money, got, or we have our money back. Um, and presently, they're erring on the side of caution, meaning that they really don't lend out to anyone just for fear that they won't get the money back. Um, but this, I mean, farming requires investments, so, I mean, if you don't invest in the good farmers, they're going to go bankrupt even if they are good. Um, and you're going to lose money. Um, so what the pro goal here is, um, is to help banks credit rate farmers, not by doing anything that they are already doing. This is sort of to complement that. So they should keep doing what they were doing, but then we give them an extra tool. Um, the tool we're proposing is uh, a relative economic performance. So basically we take some farmer that walks into the bank and compares him to every other farmer in the country and say, well, is this a good farmer or is he a bad farmer? And if he's a good farmer, we should give him money. Um, um, the problem here is that if you're a small and medium-sized bank, then you actually don't have a lot of data to work with. So if all you know are bad farmers, then when a mediocre farmer comes in, uh, you might think this is the greatest farmer ever. Uh, of course he's not, and he's probably going to go bankrupt. Um, so why don't they have any data? Well, farms are private companies. They don't really have any obligation to publish the data. It's not in their interest to publish data, because if they do, they might be... Uh, worse off in some future negotiation with someone else. Um, this doesn't mean that people don't have data. We have uh, an agricultural knowledge center, VFL, 
that actually collects data. And their sort of core business me is uh, uh, knowledge services to farmers and veterinarians and stuff like that. Um, but they're actually willing to sell this data, but not all banks are willing to pay for it. So uh, basically, it's too costly. Um, so you could say, well, we have someone who has the data. Why not just tell the, the VFL about this customer? Well, banks, they don't want to disclose customer relations, of course. They're sort of uh, a bit picky about that. Um, another re reason is that we're hoping that uh, banks want to influence how the, all of this uh, data is perceived. So for example, um, they might, might want to specify what the price of land uh, is going to be in the future. And if you have a lot of land, that's good, even though presently you owe more money than it's worth. Um, but this really sounds like uh, a two-party computation setting. So, uh, I mean, we have two parties. We have VFL, who has a database, and the banks, who has some farmer that they want to evaluate. Um, and possibly more data, and now we want to do secure computation. So traditionally, what we would do is you would go out and find a consultancy house, uh, basically bribe them not to be corrupt. This is expensive. Um, and this is, I mean, people are doing this for a lot of different things, but it's not really relevant here because banks could just go to VFL and buy the data themselves. Um, that's going to be expensive as well, of course, but then they at least have the data. Um, so hopefully I've um, motivated you to say that we have something that we want to compute, sort of at least in a fuzzy way, um, and it's two-party computation. So getting more formal about what we want to compute, um, well, we want to do the data development analysis. Um, basically, it's a, an approach from economics that's apparently very popular. I mean, thousands of papers on it. Um, it's based, it's based on uh, best practice comparisons. So you won't, don't want to compare to every other farmer out in the country. You want to compare to only the best ones. Because you're really not interested in whether or not some farmer is, um, I mean, exactly how good he is compared to everyone else. You really just want to know, is he good or isn't he? Um, so the intuition of, about this is that uh, you have businesses, in this case farms, they uh, consume some resources and they produce something. Um, so with this very, very simple example here, um, we pay wages and we have generate profit. Uh, sort of a very uh, silly example probably, but uh, it's nice to have something you can show in 2D. Um, there are five points here, and then what we do is we take each of the business viewed as a point in a d-dimensional space. Two in this case. Um, d is the sum of the, no uh, is the number of inputs and outputs all combined. And then the benchmark is uh, you want to know the distance to the convex hull in some direction. Um, so this is why we have this uh, convex hull at the top. And the, uh, the idea of why it sort of looks like this is because it's, you could probably ha have a farm that uh, pays no wages and that doesn't generate a profit. That seems reasonable. And uh, when you look at P3, then increasing the wages, you should be able to keep up the, uh, or generate the same gross uh, profit even if you increase the wages. Um, of course, the, the distance to the convex hull is now if, you're, if P5 walks into a bank, then they want to know how much sh profit should he be generating given the wages he's paying. Um, of course, there is no farmer that, does exa that is exactly um, paying the same wages but generating more profit. But uh, we say we have a virtual farmer that is the, the weighted average of some of these other farmers. And that way, I mean, that virtual farmer is what we want to compare to. All right, so uh, the DEA, that translates into the linear programming. And that's, uh, I assume most people here know it, if not everyone, but let me just give you a very, very brief recap. Uh, we have a linear function in n variables, x1 through xn, and then we have some linear constraints on those variables. Um, what we want is to find uh, the maximal value or minimal value that f will take over these uh, variables given the constraints in questions. Um, sometimes we might also be interested in, in figuring out what is the assignment to the xi that gives us this, or I should rather say an assignment to the xi that gives us this. It, it doesn't have to be unique.
All right. Um, basically, we can take the, the develop, um, data and development analysis and translate that to an LP problem. Um, and as a bonus, um, there are a lot of optimizations problems out in the world that uh, an LP solver can solve. So <laughs> even if this fails to emerge as an application, then uh, an LP solver can uh, be used for a lot of other things. So I know that people have been looking at um, secure supply chain management as an example. Um, so the requirements for the, the solver given by the setting, well, we have two parties. We could add more parties if it would make sense, but sort of uh, as a basic idea, we really only have two parties. Um, we want this thing to be fast. So um, it's the way we view it is a farmer comes into a bank and then they run the protocol, um, which of course means that, that we need very uh, high response, uh, very fast response system, but it's okay if they've been working, uh, generating random data in advance. <laughs> So maybe they've been uh, doing this over the weekend, over the night, and then they know that at some point in time in the future, some farmer is going to walk into the bank and we want to run the LP solver. Um, we would very much like active security. Um, probably we could get away with covert security. Maybe we could even get away with passive security, but it's not clear that people aren't going to try to cheat. So uh, going for the best uh, security possible, that's of course always a good thing. Um, as I said before, there are people who have been looking at uh, LP solvers before. So uh, initial papers basically tried to take the, um, the LP problem and uh, sort of uh, mask it. So I mean, view it as points in the space, for instance, and then try to stretch it and uh, twist it and do whatever. Um, and then uh, reveal the outcome of this and then solve that. That's a new linear programming problem and then apply the inverse transformation on the solution. Um, so there are some problems with doing this. First of all, uh, Bethnard et al. pointed out that if you're not careful with the transformation, then you lose correctness. You can just sort of uh, completely go wrong. Um, <coughs> last year, Laud and Pankova showed that uh, if you know part of the input, and then you know, uh, see the mask problem, then you actually stand to uh, to lose all privacy in some cases. Um, so this is why I call this a heuristic. It's basically, we hope that, we, we don't have a formal definition of security and we just hope that uh, uh, pulling in our space is going to mask something. Of course, since this is a workshop on multi-party computation, this is not good enough. <coughs> all right, so uh, there are actually a few uh, solvers out there, um, some MPC constructions. And all of them are based on the simplex method, which I'll get to on the next slide. Um, so the first paper was by Lee and Atala, who did a two-party protocol where the inputs are arbitrarily distributed by, between the two. Um, I came up with, uh, solved some issues in that paper and then uh, went out to the case where we actually don't know anything about uh, the inputs. The inputs can be generated by secure computation or it can be arbitrarily distributed. Um, Vijay had a paper in the setting where one party holds all the constraints, um, in which case you can get some efficiency gains. So, but this is not applicable to us. Regarding um, uh, implementation, Katharina and de Hoog had a paper uh, a few years ago that uh, actually implemented my protocol with honest majority and passive security only, so it doesn't really fit our setting. Another thing is they used fixed point arithmetic so one of the problems with uh, the, the LP solver is that the intermediate numbers grow. There is an upper bound on them, and it's not too big, but you're, I mean, even when you start with reasonably small inputs, you get large values. Um, so you avoid this by doing fixed point arithmetic. Basically, it's floating point numbers using multi-party computation. Um, this means that, uh, I mean, and it runs, this thing. Um, Things are, I mean, basic operation, you avoid large numbers, but the basic operations become more expensive. And, um, and of course, it doesn't really fit the requirements of the setting we have. Um, all right. So the simplex method. Just a small question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you need to assume a finite field to move? 
Um, yeah. It will, it will be uh, embedded in a finite field, yes. But I mean, you could also work with Boolean values, and I'll get back to why we're not doing it later. For most of reward applications, you don't have a finite field. You have integers or something like that. Yeah. How do you? So, um, can I get, skip that until I think maybe it's later this slide? Okay. Yeah. No, it's a good question. It's, it's on the slide. Okay, so um, Simplex basically works with uh, we have the, an initial problem, and then we say we find some initial assignments of the XI, and then we say, can we get a better one? And as long as we can find a better one, then we up, uh, take that better assignment, update the problem, and say, can we get a better one again? We'll just keep doing that until we can't get a better assignment. Um, and my original uh, protocol, that required integer arithmetic, as you point out, is, that is exactly what we need, uh, as well as comparison. <coughs> um, but we don't actually need integer arithmetic. What we, I mean, we can pretend that, uh, I mean, w if we work in ZM, where M is a prime, then we have field arithmetic. But we can pretend it's integer arithmetic, as long as we don't overflow. And since we know that size of our inputs and we have an upper bound on the size of the numbers we're going to compute on, then everything will be fine. We just pick a larger M. And you don't need divisions? Um, we need divisions, but they're going to be proper. So we can do that by uh, multiplying by the inverse in the field. So the remainder is always going to be zero. So this is, uh, really, this is one of the tricks of that paper. Um, one thing that is uh, probably not so good, this is that the termination condition is published at each, at each pivot. So, uh, I mean, we repeatedly try to find a better solution, but we tell how many updates we perform. Um, and you say, this is not a good thing, we're leaking extra information. Um, this is true, but I mean, this is the case for every other protocol out there. Um, we could also sort of hide the thing by doing, <coughs> saying we expect to perform, say, 10 uh, updates. So we perform 20 updates in all. And then some of these are going to be dummy updates that aren't going to do anything. Um, but I mean, this is the only thing we can do because the simplex method is uh, exponential in the worst case. Um, so if we don't want to reveal anything, we have to work, perform exponential work. And this is not really feasible. Um, so basically what we've implemented is a variation of my protocol from before. And the two core idea, uh, changes are for efficiency. So the first thing is uh, this determine a better assignment to the, uh, to the XI. So we use uh, Danzig's pivot rule rather than Blantz. If you don't know what they are, it doesn't really matter. The reason I the Blantz was used in the original paper is that this ensures termination. So when I say determine a better assignment to the XI, what I really should say is determine a not worse assignment to the XI. We can take one that is equally good. Um, but with Danzig's pivot rule, we might end up uh, cycling between equally good solutions rather than finding the optimal one. It doesn't happen in practice, but I mean, from a theoretic perspective, it's not a nice thing to have. The reason we use it here is, of course, because it's more efficient. We generally get fewer pivots. The second cha change we made is to go for revised simplex. Um, so rather than try to actually update the whole problem, we just keep track of changes. So we're in a setting where we have a lot of variables, but very few constraints. And um, keeping track of the changes, that's basically a, a, an M by M, uh, keeping track of M by M matrices, where M is the number of constraints, rather than M times N by N plus M. Sorry, M times N plus M, yeah. So this gets much more efficient. Uh, um, with regard to updates, um, and I mean, we shave off a, a constant factor. So th there's nothing huge uh, theoretically going on here. It's just some optimizations. Um, so what are we actually uh, building this based on? Well, it's based on speeds. We heard a bit about it earlier today. Um, the reason is we get very fast field arithmetic. So if we pick M as prime, then we get uh, exactly what we needed, and it's based on additive secret sharing. Um, so what this means is, of course, we get additions for free. We, get, uh, and we have beaver triples for multiplications. Basically, a beaver triple is uh, two random values, and the product of, the two, of those two values 
held in secret shared form, and you can then do an actual multiplication based on that. Um, there's also a pre-processing protocol, but we really don't care about that because I mean, we're only w worried about the online efficiency. Um, so now I can get back to why uh, we chose this. Well, rather than something that works on bits, um, well, we have a lot of additions and multiplications, order uh, n times m, whereas we only have n plus m comparisons. So it's good to choose primitives that uh, make sure that the additions we're doing a lot of are efficient and then the comparisons then get expensive, but this is not too bad because there aren't too many of them. Um, regarding those comparisons, this, uh, the, one we've, the protocol we've chosen to implement is uh, a protocol by Lipman and myself. And the reason we've chosen this is that it is uh, logarithmic multiplications online, so logarithmic in the bit length which means very few. I mean, if you have 1,000-bit numbers, then it's only O of 10. I mean, the constant is 5 in there, or something along those lines. One thing regarding the, the modules M is we need it to be larger than uh, 2 to the kappa plus 2L, where L is the bit length of our values. So the reason for kappa is the a statistical, parameter, uh, a statistical <coughs> parameter in the um, multiplication protocol. So you can think of this as maybe 80. Um, the reason for the two is we have to compare fractions. So we hold two values, uh, I mean, we have four values, two numerators, two denominators, and we want to compare them, and we do that by multiplying across. And then we have integer comparison again, but with twice as big numbers. Um, and the only thing that's missing is actually that because of Danzig's rule, then we, uh, we can't do things from the original paper, we actually have to find the minimal of multiple inputs. And we've just chosen the, the simplest thing we could think of, and that's the tournament selection. So we have, given a comparison protocol, you should be able to come up with a protocol that selects the minimal of the two. Um, it's quite straightforward if you have a greater than a co and uh, arithmetic. Um, and once you have that, you can build a tournament selection. That's completely straightforward, <coughs> too. Of course, this gives you log rounds. Um, as I said, we've implemented this thing, and for the size of, uh, I mean, the data size, we have uh, something like 285 farmers, and they have three <coughs> inputs, which give rise to four constraints. Um, when we run it, these, uh, the protocol, then we typically get less than 10 pivots, um, and each pivot uh, is something like uh, less than 3,000 multiplications and 300 greater lands. So how efficient is it? Oh, I should say one thing before we go. It's a, a Java implementation speeds, and we've, we are actually executing on some uh, Amazon cloud computers, so C1 extra large. So the C is for uh, compute optimized. Um, I'm not sure we couldn't actually run this with similar timings on smaller uh, machines. Um, I mean, this is what was used for the benchmark that you'll see now. Um, so if we have a pivot, it takes about 22 seconds, and with ten, less than 10 pivots, it's something on the order of three to four minutes. So it's reasonable. We can do that while the uh, farmer is sitting in the bank waiting, uh, say, discussing with the, uh, the manager. Um, so where's the time spent? Well, it's uh, basically it's the comparison protocol. Um, so this second benchmark with insecure greater than, that's simply just when we want to compare two things rather than run the protocol, we just output them and look at them and could figure out which one is the smaller and input that value straight back into the system. Uh, yeah? Is this the host phase or only the online phase? That's only the online phase. We're, we don't care about the pre-processing. Um, so as we can see here, I mean, with this, the whole uh, simplex takes uh, less than five seconds. Uh, but of course, this is not what we want to do. Um, oh yeah, one important thing here is, uh, maybe you think that this is sort of a toy example. Uh, we only have uh, three input outputs for the farmers. So when I say input output in this sense, I mean it in the economic sense. They consume some resources and produce something. Um, but increasing M is not actually too bad. So in, in the real world terms, you might want to go all the way up to seven, eight, nine. Uh, that would be an option. 
But if you look at it, this is not really going to change the number of comparisons, which is the expensive operation. So, I mean, this should definitely be doable. Um, regarding greater than, well, um, I think I said before, we have around five uh, log L multiplic uh, multiplications. Mul I mean, we have free ends. Oh, sorry, we have free additions because we're working with additive secret sharing. So we're only counting multiplications. All right, five minutes? Sounds good. Okay. So we have these uh, five log L multiplications. We're doing 300 in parallel. This gives us, uh, uh, this gives us something like uh, 12,000 multiplications overall for the entire pro uh, pivot. And this is, I mean, I guess uh, four times as many <coughs> as we have uh, multiplications, uh, sorry, basic multiplications. So, I mean, it's expected that the bulk of the time is used there, but it still uh, seems very expensive. There we go. So if you think of doing 200 uh, comparisons in parallel, uh, we would expect it to take 40 times as long as it takes 200 uh, multiplica multiplications in parallel. Um, and this is not the case. Rather than taking uh, two seconds, which is this 40 times 50 milliseconds, it takes 12 to 14 seconds. So there is almost an order of magnitude gone missing somewhere in there. Um, Theory says that local computation is free. Well, uh, actually, what we find out is that uh, the CPU is not maxed out. So it's not local computation that's the problem. And uh, this is sort of queuing up, and we have to figure out what is going on. And uh, we don't know, I must admit. Um, some possible causes could be disk access. So we have pre-processed values that we load from disk for the comparison. And they're um, not really stored in the optimal way. So rather than store uh, numbers, shared shares of numbers of a certain bit length, we store shares of bits and then combine the numbers online. Um, it was the simplest way of implementing it, but I mean, it, it sort of also means that uh, we're doing work online that we should, don't need to do. And especially this disk access, you have, we have a, a quite large blow up because we need large numbers underway. Um, Another uh, possible reason is that we, uh, the way this, uh, this is implemented in a framework in Aarhus, where the way this framework works is by trying to, uh, it picks which uh, multiplication gates to evaluate online. So it tries to say, well, these gates are ready for execution, so now I evaluate them, and then we look at what we can do afterwards. So you can view this as sort of a, a just-in-time decision. And of course, this, the strategy we're using might not actually be the best one. So there might be uh, something that, uh, that we can do that's a lot better. Um, but uh, finishing off, um, we've implemented it. And we, it's actually being demoed by uh, real banks now. There's a, uh, they have access to a website, and they can uh, log in. Or rather, they should be able to log in, but they're not. Um, they're not allowed to install uh, software on their work computers, and their, um, and their browser is not compatible with uh, some JavaScript that we have used from a library. So uh, <laughs> it's tricky to implement things in the real world. The crypto is, this, this is the easiest part. Um, <coughs> but what we can do when we actually run tests on it is we can see that we can actually uh, solve problem sizes of realistic size in uh, minutes. So, I mean, we can actually do what we want. Um, of course, we really want to improve this implementation. So first off, get a better greater than, um, and then we have a lot of other ideas. Final slide. Um, if you are waking up, you, what you should take home. Um, we've implemented an LP solver, and we can do uh, joint credit rating without actually revealing uh, input on farmers. Um, the reason, I mean, the banks want this because they want to do the credit rating. Uh, VFL actually, uh, I mean, they normally sell data, but this, they actually see this as a business case. So, I mean, rather than selling, bank, uh, selling data to banks who aren't willing, to, trying to sell data to banks who aren't willing to pay for it, they can instead sell uh, analyses. So every time the bank does a query, they pay for it. Um, another lesson to take home is that if, uh, if people have a problem and they don't have a, can't see a solution and they can't continue the way they're, they're going, they're, they're actually easier to convince. Try, you can actually tr uh, convince them to try new things. 
Um, this is a case here with the banks. It's not really, I mean, if they don't lend out money, they have a pro they're going to have problems in the future. If they lend out money to the wrong people, they'll also have problems. So they know they have a problem. That's the important thing. Um, and most of the implementation issues we've come across aren't actually uh, cryptographic in nature. So that was it. With the pre-processing, uh, there is an implementation in Bristol that uh, we have access to. So, so, so the farmers like, come in ahead of time? The, the farmers uh, <coughs> hand da their data to VFL. VFL has everything in the clear. Oh, okay. And then it's just a question of them uh, sharing, uh, okay. secret sharing it with the bank. Uh, it seems that you need one multiplication to triple for every multiplication that you perform in the online yeah. case. Yes. And how do you know the number of multiplication triples beforehand? I mean, we don't. Okay. So, I mean, we, we know, we can count how many we need for a pivot, but we can't tell how many pivots we're going to perform. But I mean, if we, we don't even know if we're going to perform an LP now. So we can also say we generate enough and More than, more than we expect to use, but I mean, uh, if we don't use them today, probably there'll be a farmer coming in tomorrow and then we can use them. Okay, so our next talk will be by Abdurrahman Ali, and he will tell us about standard network flow problems with secure multi-party computation. Uh. Hi everybody, um, I'm Abdel Rahman Ali, as the kind chairman said. Uh, I come from La, the Université Catholique de Louvain, uh, that's really close to Brussels, that's in Belgium. Uh, CORE is an institute on operational research, so basically I'm trying to solve uh, optimization problems, uh, combinatorial, combinatorial in nature, uh, using secure multi-party computation, this is on the framework of a project funded by, uh, by, the, by the government. And I'm a PhD student there. I work with uh, Matthew Van Biv, which is the professor in, in charge of the project. So as you may notice, I'm a bit nervous because it's the first time I actually present this, and it's the first time I do uh, a presentation to the SMC community. So I really hope uh, you, you at least like it a bit. Uh, so uh, I guess I'm going to start doing what I do, what I do when I'm nervous, so I'm going to confess an, an embarrassing secret. Uh, I'm an engineer, so <laughs> uh, as an engineer, I actually love applications. So I remember this day I went to talk with my supervisor and he said, okay, we have this SMC framework, it's called Beef, it looks really nice, and I have these optimization problems that you could try to find and use and I said, okay, you know, I really would like to use it on some network applications. And he said, yeah, cool. We could work on Maxflows, for instance. So we work a, a, a couple of months and we produce an algorithm to actually solve the Maxflow problem using secure multi-party computation. But I felt that it was not complete because uh, I wanted to use it on networks. So only knowing the max flow of a network was not enough for me and for him neither. So we decided to try to look for the best configuration of a network uh, of a maximum flow uh, at a minimum cost. So maybe we can, ah, where is the, oh, here. So, oh, it works. So to do something like that, we need to actually calculate uh, the minimum cost flow problem. So what uh, our goal was, was to actually calculate first the maximum <coughs> flow of a network, then calculate the minimum cost flow problem, and then to have a network configuration that can have the maximum input of flow inside uh, at the minimum cost possible. So we were thinking about possible applications, and we imagine this this world. So I, I'm going to try to give you a small example first. Sorry, again, I'm really nervous, so I uh, uh, really apologize. This is what I want to talk about. 
I'm gonna talk. Uh, I'm gonna give you a, a small example of what I about we are pursuing. Then I'm gonna comment on the results, some computational experiments that I learned this afternoon. I, I'm not sure if I have. I, I did it in a correct fashion. They are completely numeric and with a lot of times in my computer. So, and then some future work I, I wanna try on. Uh, so the example that we thought, of course. We are in Europe, so it's Europe-based. So we thought a lot about WAN networks. So you know these WAN networks are uh, small in nature in the number of persons that the, uh, of participants or players that are involved. Uh, usually these networks have many competitors inside of, inside of them. So for instance, uh, in the banking system, you usually have uh, this one network that serves to communicate between banks to do monetary transactions, and also you have control agencies, uh, at least in Europe, I don't know if, if in here, that actually monitoring these kind of transactions. So uh, in this alternative world that we were thinking, we actually believe that the banks, they don't trust each other. We don't, I actually not, don't know if it's like that in the real world, but. I suppose they don't trust each other. So usually they want to hide as much information as they want. So now imagine that there is a guy in, Dexia is a, it's an European bank. So there is a guy sitting in there that wants to send some information through the LAN network. The thing is that inside of the LAN network, uh, you don't have, usually you don't have direct links to all the other places of the network. So you have to, to try to trust in routing tables to send information through. So maybe the information in this really silly configuration is going to travel through other banks to get to the European agency. So now let's think in a more complex configuration. We have more banks, and there are several paths to get to, to the destiny. So we could use this path. It would depend on the amount of information each link can actually absorb and the cost of each of these links. Uh, it could be this one, or it could be either this other one, or it could be this third one. Okay, we, we really don't know. Uh, to actually know that, as I said, we depend on uh, various heuristics. We calculate the heuristics, then we came up with routing tables, and then we define that actually this was the cheapest configuration for the amount of information that I wanted to send. Okay. Now, what if the banks actually they don't want to disclose the, this information uh, to calculate the routing tables? They don't want to disclose their latency or the traffic that the routers tolerate, and many other parameters that are actually used in these modern and complex algorithmics to, to get these routing tables. So maybe they don't want to disclose this information uh, because the other banks or uh, can, they, they could use this information to perform attacks. Of course, I am not uh, saying that the banks attack each other, but it could happen. We, we don't know. This is an alternative universe. Okay, so many applications like the, like the one that I described can be found not only in networking, but in, th in, in supply chain uh, problems. As I mentioned, I work in a in an operational research center that works a lot with supply chain problems. So you have a lot of routing problems and in which SMC can actually be used and, the, uh, and this kind of network flow problems can be actually a real, a real life application. So as I mentioned, it's already published this work about max flow. So now I wanted to work with a minimum, flow, minimum cost flow and to actually achieve it we need to calculate the minimum mean cycle of, of a graph. So I'm going to talk a bit about the problems. First, uh, about the environment that I am assuming we have with, with SMC. I'm going to assume that we can, do, we can perform secure additions, we can perform secure multiplications and secure comparisons. Uh, at the beginning of the project, this is 2011, uh, 2010, these are the frameworks that were like uh, fashion, the, the fashion of the time were these, these frameworks that I'm uh, putting in there. 
And we also have uh, limited CPU power and limited memory access. Mm. OK, so I'm also assuming that uh, the communications, the cost of uh, processing communications increases uh, linearly on the number of players and the cost of the computations actually increase in a polynomial fashion with the number of players. So that's why using uh, this kind of, uh, of secure sharing computation, it's uh, on these problems like a uh, one network which has limited number of players, it's actually, for me, uh, a, a good idea. And comparisons. As Thomas said before, it's really expensive. It's much. It's really more expensive than a single multiplication. So now a bit uh, on the problem. Uh, I'm presenting here a small generalization of the minimum cost flow problem. Uh, this is actually the formulation of a circulation problem that was presented in the 70s, I, I believe. But it's more general, and it serves well to explain uh, our goals now. So we assume that we work on a directed graph. Uh, we also assume that uh, the graph is symmetric. So if there is a link from A to B, there is a link to, from B to, to A. Uh, all the edges have capacities. And all the edges, they have costs. And the costs are anti-symmetric. So if to send, inform to send uh, 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 units from A to B costs five uh, units on one edge, then uh, to do the opposite, it's, it's going to cost minus five units. And the formulation of the problem actually is a minimization problem. And it's the simple multiplication of the cost times the units of flow that we are sending through the edges. And then we add up all of that, and we want to minimize that. The constraints, of course, are that the flow doesn't surpass the capacity of the edge. And the flow has to be uh, anti-symmetric as well. And this is a conservation constraint that says that all flow that enters to a node has to be equal to all flow that exits the node. OK? As I, as I mentioned, this problem is equivalent to the circulation cost problem. And there are several algorithms to, to solve this problem. I'm just putting here some solutions. And the second one is the cycle canceling algorithm that is uh, not polynomial. So in the 70s, it was proposed uh, an alternative to this algorithm that is a strongly polynomial, that is the minimum mean cycle canceling algorithm that uses the basis of the cycle canceling algorithm, selecting the, the cycles that they want to minimize. Yes? You go back one slide? Yeah, sure. Uh, you want to do it securely? So yeah, yeah, I want to do it securely. You're saying, what is, for example, is the graph known? Is the graph public? Uh, what is the secret here? Everything is secret here. So from the structure of the graph to the capacities of the edges to the, to the costs of the edges. And you're also hiding the topology of the graph. Yeah, I, I'm hiding the topology as well. Yeah? And who knows those? Does a single person know? So for instance, if we go back to the example, so each one of the agents knows the edges that uh, are going out from him, but he doesn't know anything else. So <laughs> they know to whom they are connected with, but they don't know anything more than that. And the costs that each edge has. OK, so this is the basic algorithm to, to solve the problem. Uh, this is the the normal representation of the of the algorithm so they by the, of uh, of the algorithm of the mean cycle canceling uh, problem this is the standard formulation so as you may see as i said so they iterate through all the cycles that the, all the negative cycles that the uh, that the graph contains till there are no more cycles and they choose the one uh, that has the less the, the, the smallest minimum mean uh, cycle inside. So that's what they do. So the first iteration they arrive, they look for the minimum mean cycle inside the graph. They select that one. They look for the flow that they can send through that uh, cycle. They isolate the cycle. That they send the flow inside. And they repeat that till there are no negative cycles. So that's how it works. OK? So for. To obtain the minimum mean cycle, that's uh, a bit more easier. 
This is also a problem solved in the 70s, I believe. Uh, in here, you can see some uh, of the generalities of the problem. First, this m function here is actually just the mean of a given sequence of edges. C, in this case, is just a set of the directed edges that form a cycle. And the assumptions, the, the, the two inputs actually are the same as in the problem before. So we have capacities on the edges. We don't need costs for this special uh, instance for the general problem. In, and in this case, the, 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 the capacities, the U units, are, uh, are going to be the costs. OK, so this is the general algorithm to solve the minimum mean cycle problem. Uh, so what basically it does is to calculate this DK function, which actually calculates the lesser costly path of K, uh, of K edges uh, from a given source. And this is just a min-max problem that can be solved with a recursion. So how to implement this in code, how to implement this in, in real life, well, that depends on your level of skills and how you want to do it. Uh, but this is the general principle of the algorithm. So in here, there are many things that if we think about it for a second, if we want to use secure multi-party computation on it, that we can do. We cannot do. We cannot do branching. And we don't know how to determine uh, which one is the minimum of this DK, or which one is the minimum DK path that contains the cycle. So this is how we propose to do it. Okay, uh, I, I know it looks uh, a bit big, but uh, I, I actually don't have time to go to all the specificities. But this is just for you to, to see this big division in the middle. So if we pay attention here. So the first half of it is just to calculate the, all the DK paths. So we get all the DK paths, and then in here, we solve the, the max mean uh, problem that you saw uh, a moment ago. So I want to point out the challenges. So the main challenges that we might find on it is that, for instance, as we are hiding the structure of the graph as well, we actually don't know, first, if there is an edge in there or there is not an edge in there. Second, we don't know if it's saturated or not. So we are implementing a big M in there that help, helps us to isolate the edges that doesn't exist or either are saturated. The second thing is how to save all these uh, paths that we are saving. Well, we have a four-dimensional uh, array in there, two dimensions to save all the four-dimensional matrices that are formed for the paths. And finally, uh, we have to also isolate, isolate the, the, the cycle on which we want to augment the, the flow. So that's have to be done in there as well. So you will have to believe me. We are doing that. OK, and for the MCC algorithm, well, this is more straightforward. It's more or less the same that you saw before. The main problem is that we cannot do it in one single, one single while loop. As Thomas Toff said before, uh, we have to run this thing through the maximum uh, complexity function. So uh, if uh, we don't want to do that, we have to implement a stopping condition, a termination condition. Uh, that's the, the standard for this kind of, of problems. So we, that's the downside. We have to, at some point, uh, uh, make public how many iterations we have done, and, uh, uh, as, as Thomas Toff said before. Uh, in here also, we, we in here, as we may see here, yeah, are uh, trying to maintain this RC matrix. Uh, for what uh, we maintain this uh, residual capacity matrix is to know whether uh, 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 edge is saturated or not. And this value here is used in here. So you see up there, uh, we use it to actually implement the big M thing there. So finally, these are some of the bounds. I have to remember to, to, to point out that the, the algorithm, the original algorithm, is a strongly polynomial. So the original algorithm has a polynomial bound of n to the 8. 
our SMC alternative actually has a bound of n to the 10. This actually comes from an extra set of rounds that we have to do when we generate the paths. So maybe do you remember in some slides before, we generate all, the, all, all these walks and we have to uh, save them in this huge 4x4 four four dimensional array. So to do that, we actually need a couple of extra fours in there. So actually, that's why the complexity in here augments in the number of multiplications. And the comparisons, uh, they are following the bounds of the original problem. That's important because the comparisons are more expensive. So I run some computational experiments in the framework that, at the time, was the, the one that we consider the best alternative. In this case, it's BIF. Uh, uh, we try it uh, with four nodes to ten, to 10 nodes, and we run it for three and four parties. And we use a server with 16 cores and 48 gigabytes in RAM. So each iteration of the algorithm actually costs a lot. So for four edges, uh, it costs around 17 seconds in our current uh, configuration. And for four players, like 19 seconds. So it's, it's a bit expensive. Uh, we also wanted to compare the algorithm uh, to real world implementations. And we also wanted to compare the algorithm running without beef uh, and compare it uh, to what it happens if beef to actually isolate the effect of the big constants that uh, the calculus on SMC actually with beef, in this case, actually. Uh, brings. And these are the results. Again, the, the, it has a polynomial behavior. But at least in this clean implementation that doesn't have beef of the same algorithm, uh, the problem is solved in something like 20 seconds. So that gives me hopes that if at some point we actually manage to minimize the impact of, of the cost of a round in, in, in secure multiparty <laughs> computation, this can be actually quite fast. Uh, with beef, the, the times they explode. So if we run the algorithm to the termination without the termination condition, it takes for four nodes. Uh, and in a complete graph, something around like 20,000 seconds. So that's a lot. Uh, we also calculate the, ra the ratio between, uh, uh, between the clean implementation. This is the, yeah. So we also calculate the ratio between the clean implementation and the standard implementation of, uh, sorry, we also calculate the ratio between the clean implementation and the, and the BIF implementation. That's the one in there. And this one is the one, the one in BIF versus, uh, uh, versus uh, a standard implementation of, uh, of the minimum mean cycle problem. So you may see it's also really high. And as the uh, complexity bounds, they change. Also, the, the ratio follows the behavior of the complexity bounds. Uh, this is some future work that we want to do with it. So Toth presented a really nice uh, uh, pri priority queue a couple of years ago. Uh, we thought about using it to try to accelerate it. Uh, stop using beef and try to use our own implementations might be faster. Maybe you, you remember that in the beginning I proposed this for a rotor problem. So rotors, they cannot actually run Python and beef it's done in Python. So we might need to move this to C. And actually we are working on it right now and we are having really nice time bounds. And that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you at least enjoyed a bit the, the presentation. It was not so really boring. So thank you very much. That's it. Questions? Yeah. In, one your, in one of your slides, you mentioned applying linear programming to this. Yeah, because. But it's a, it's a, gr it's a very discrete optimization problem, right? So it, it's it? something linear programming. Right. It's a subset of a program, but you never divide it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you, you can put this on a solver and it's going to 
solve the problem, actually. <coughs> so more questions? No? OK, let's thank the speaker. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. The third speaker in this session is uh, Mahdi oh. Zamani, and he will tell us about thank MPC in large networks with uh, application to anonymous broadcast. <coughs> All right. Uh, Hi, I'm Mahdi Zamani from University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And today I want to present our work on MPC in large networks. And I will also talk about applications of our algorithm in anonymous communication. Uh, this work is joint with Jared Seya and Manush Mubahidi from University of New Mexico. Uh, we are motiva motivate, motivated by the fact that modern networks are very large and they are growing very fast. And we are interested to see if uh, over these net large networks we can perform MPC. And we, we want actually this MPC to be very, very efficient because if the amount of work that each party does in, for, in, in the MPC is a lot, then with large number of nodes, we certainly, each party sends a lot of information. Uh, we are also interested to see that, as an example, if uh, our MPC algorithm can be used to protect freedom of speech uh, in, in large networks, for example, in Twitter, we want actually to see if it's possible to perform anonymous broadcast or anonymous tweets in, in Twitter in near future. And as you see, Twitter, for example, has about 300 million users. And this is a lot. So our goal is uh, to implement a practical MPC for large networks. And by large network, I mean from thousands of parties to billions of parties. And at the same time, we want actually to see if we can handle malicious parties. By malicious, I mean even the, the, the adversary can uh, choose a set of parties to perform coalition of um, attacks in our network. And we want actually to consider arithmetic circuits in our MPC protocol. Besides anonymous communications, uh, there are other applications that might be in that this algorithm can be used in. And among them is the secure analysis of big data. We want to see if, if, if we have a large network and a massive piece of data that we want to process, like in statistical analysis of those data, is it possible to compute that with our MPC for large networks? So in MPC, we want to compute a function, f. From now on, I will call it f. We, we consider two approaches in, in, this, pay, in this work. Uh, the first one is that we use a secret sharing scheme to share the inputs of parties securely. Um, as an example, we can use Shamir's secret sharing scheme, which has a small computation cost, and, but the big problem in that is that you, for multiplications, we usually need several rounds of communication. On the other hand, if we encrypt the inputs and we use this recent work by Gentry and all other uh, improvements on FHG after 2009 to perform fully homomorphic encryption, then the multiplication problem is solved How and, and the, we get an optimal RAM complexity. But the problem is that we, these, uh, the current FHE schemes that we have, they require a large amount of computation resource. Uh, and this is for any circuits. If we compute that for small circuits, it's efficient enough. But for large circuits, they're not, unfortunately. Here's a summary of our model. We assume that we have n parties. The parties are connected pairwise via private channels. And we assume that less than a tenth fraction of parties are malicious. And we, we, we believe that this is a, a realistic fraction in, in large networks. And the definition of malicious is that they can deviate arbitrarily from our protocol. 
We don't put any uh, constraint on the adversary. However, we assume that the adversary is computationally bounded. We used to uh, simulate some information theoretic um, MPC protocols for large networks. However, we ended up getting very, very large communication costs. So we decided to make some cryptographic assumptions to make the costs smaller. For, for now, we only consider a static adversary model, meaning that the adversary is supposed to choose the set of malicious parties at the beginning of the protocol. So he is not allowed to change that set later. And we are working to, to make this uh, constraint uh, better for adaptive adversary in the near future, but for now it's static. And finally, we assume that this communication is, async is synchronous. Here are our results. For the, these are the average costs for the entire protocol. This M here is the size of circuit, the number of gates in our circuit, N is the number of parties, kappa is the security parameter, and D is the depth of our circuit. And what is important here is that we focused on these exponents of logarithms. We, want, we actually have done our best to uh, reduce these exponents because there are other great in protocols proposed in recently. However, unfortunately, they, they have very, very large uh, logarithmic factors which are usually hidden in the soft O notation. The key idea behind getting scalability in our algorithm is using quorums. What is quorum? Quorum is a logarithmic size set of parties um, in which less than a ninth fraction of parties are malicious. So we have certain algorithms. For example, the, the state of the art in quorum building is BGH 2013, which gives us a set of n quorums and guarantees that in each quorum, that has logarithmic size of set of parties, the number of malicious parties is always less than a ninth. Yes? Yeah, sorry, but then you keep my question. But uh, in the settings that you're talking about, there can be parties which are just not available at that point, like in any network. But I don't think you're counting them in your malicious parties. Uh, yes, we count them. But if, if, the, if the nodes stop working and they don't send any, anything, and they don't receive anything? Is, is that the? Yeah. Uh, we assume that those are counted in this ninth fraction. But then that's really for generally in any big network, half guy or even more, like on Facebook or take any network, most of the parties are not online. Right? But we assume that those, we only, a ninth fraction of them can be offline. And this is part of our model. Uh, and we, we assume that. But you're right. In, in a real network, we cannot assume that they're always online. But we can work on, uh, to make our uh, security guarantees less by, incre by increasing this fraction, by actually decreasing this fraction of malicious parties. However, our security guarantees will be worse. Recently, this MP quorum idea was, has been used for MPC. Uh, these two results are the most important recent results. The scalable MPC idea of DKMS uh, proposes a very great uh, resource cost using uh, the idea of quorums. However, unfortunately, this idea has a lot of um, hidden logarithmic factors in their cost. So it's, it would be very hard to implement this in practice. And the communication locality in MPC by BGT is a great protocol which uses FHE and is a cryptographic protocol. However, it's not completely load balanced, unfortunately. Here's a list of the building blocks that we use for our protocol. We first, for verifiable secret sharing and performing zero knowledge proofs, we used the efficient VSS scheme of KZG in 2010. This algorithm is based on Shamir's secret sharing and generates very efficient commitments for each of the pieces that are shared in the network. And the commitments are, are checked 
in a very, very efficient way. And we use the threshold FHE scheme of AGATV, which is an adopted version of BGV um, for, for the malicious case. You know that basic fully homomorphic encryption is just secure for semi-honest. It just provides secrecy. And it, and it doesn't work. And this is scheme actually can tolerate up to a third fraction of parties to be malicious and deviate from the protocol. Uh, we also get some ideas from the pre-processing model of DPSZ. Uh, th this is a very nice and interesting paper. And they use, they, they, in, in the paper, they suggest that the correct way of using FHE is to use it in a pre-processing. Because FHE is currently actually SHE, is somewhat homomorphic encryption. Because it cannot compute very deep circuits. The correct way of using FHE is just to use it to create a set of multiplication triples. As, Can yes? Can you tell us what is AGTV? Uh, it's Asharov et al., 2012. And so we, we use this idea in our model. So our model is also a pre-processing model. We divide the phases of our algorithm to offline and online phase. Here's the general idea of our, our, our protocol. We first create n quorums using the result of VGH. And then we assign, assign each gate G of our circuit to one of the quorums. Let's call it Q. And for each party in Q, that gate, that quorum assigned to that gate G com does the computation of that gate over secret shared inputs. And these secret shared inputs are over Shamir secret sharings. So assume that they are all evaluations of a polynomial, a random polynomial. From now, I will denote a, a quorum using a red, a yellow uh, circle, and by a indexed i and b indexed i, I mean player i is holding one share of the inputs and wants to calculate the share of the output. So each of the gates are, are building blocks of an, a large circuit with two inputs, each of them, and one output. And the challenges are first a resharing process. After one gate, a quorum, this is a quorum. So assume that this is a, log, a set of log, logarithmic number of parties. After the results of the first quorum is calculated, we need a method to send it securely to the next quorum. And this is a technically challenging problem. Because if you just, each of the parties in this quorum, they directly send the shares, their own shares to their corresponding party in the next quorum, then for several steps, it's possible for the adversary to form a coalition of bad parties to get the information, to get some information from this sharing. So the first challenge is to perform this resharing of Shamir's secret chain uh, securely. This means that, the, that C prime I will be a refreshed share, meaning that it's on a new random polynomial, however, it has the same Y intercept as C of I. And the second one, obviously, is the multiplication problem. Because as you know, it's not possible to compute the multiplication over shares. The product of shares is not necessarily equal to the product. The a share of the product is not necessarily equal to the product of shares. Because the product of shares will generate a, a secret which is on an, an a higher degree polynomial. And it soon gets out of hand if we do these multiplications over shares. So we need another trick to, de to solve this problem. First, I focus on the resharing problem. One great property of Shamir's secret sharing is that the shares can be easily refreshed. This was also uh, pointed out by Shamir in his paper. Uh, and he says that, OK, a coalition of parties of, the, of security breaches cannot be accumulated if we regularly refresh these shares. And the general idea is to generate a new polynomial with the same free term. But by that free term, I mean the constant term in the polynomial, in the Shamir's random polynomial. Here's our idea for resharing in our model. Suppose that these are the x and y axis. 
and phi of x be the polynomial that has y-intercept at c. And c is the result of the computation of gate. So c is secret, and the, the parties will calculate evaluations of their identities or, or just random numbers over this polynomial as their own shares. And this is distributed by the dealer. And we first create a random polynomial of degree 1 less than phi of x. So, and, and assume that this line has y-intercept r, and which, where r is just a random number. And I note, here you have to note that this, phi, this row of x is uh, jointly uh, generated by all parties. So each party has only a share of this random number r. And none of them knows this r. Then we multiply x by rho of x to get a polynomial with the same degree as phi of x. And you, you know that this always passes, passes through the origin. And then finally, if we add that polynomial, that blue poly polynomial, to our original polynomial, we get a new polynomial which it, uh, has y and intercept c. And however, it's a completely random polynomial. It's a fresh polynomial. And then the, the last step is that the parties choose shares, evaluations of phi, uh, phi prime of x to get the new shares, refresh shares. OK, ne let's move forward to the multiplication over shares. We use the, the idea of DPSZ here. And we have a party in, in our core, which want actually to, who wants to compute the multiplication of his own shares. We use the TFHE, the threshold fully homomorphic encryption of Asher of et al. in the offline phase to generate a set of multiplication triples. And these should be uh, sufficient number of multiplication triples generated in the setup phase, in the offline phase. For each of the multiplications that are going to be performed in the online phase, we generate one triple. And by this i, I mean that this is a share of ui, vi, which are randoms, and wi is equal to u times v. And in the online phase, again, Based on the idea of the PSC and Beaver's multiplication triples, we just calculate the share of multiplication without performing any multiplication over sharings. So as you see, no two shares are multiplicated here. And I have to point out that these epsilon i and delta i's should be reconstructed by the parties. So since this is a random number, this is a masked value, and then epsilon i can be reconstructed. So the value of epsilon is reconstructed. And then each party uses that in this equation to compute the share of multiplication. Let's move on to the application that we have and see how this efficient MPC can help us to implement a very important uh, application, which is anonymous broadcast and is usually performed among a large number of parties. Because if you have larger number of parties, then the level of anonymity that you get will increase. So anonymity is one of those applications that inherently should be run in, in large networks. Because the hiding property, the identities of parties are hidden, become hidden uh, by the old, among all the set of messages that parties send in the network. In this problem, each party has a message to broadcast. And the goal is that no coalition of parties should be able to map the messages to the identities of the, the senders. Current schemes are either very vulnerable, are, are either vulnerable to traffic analysis or, that, or are very impractical. So this has motivated us to see, for example, Tor is, is the most famous uh, anonymous communication scheme. It is vulnerable to traffic analysis. 
However, this scheme is not. But remember, this is an anonymous broadcast. If you want to perform anonymous broadcast in Tor, then you're vulnerable to traffic analysis. But this algorithm currently has a large cost for just sending one message. So we assume that each party has something to send. Of course, they can just put zero in, in their messages if they don't want to send anything. However, the cost of the protocol is calculated. The idea that we have is to perform anonymous broadcasts via MPS. MPS is called, is, stands for multi-party sorting. And here's the idea. M, let's MI be the party I's message. PI picks a random value RI. And then the parties jointly sort a pair RI and MI over RI. So these RIs are chosen independently. And then the parties want to perform a multi-party sorting algorithm to sort their values. And as a result, all of them will get uh, a sorted vector of all the pairs. And it's impossible to map the identities of service, the, the clients, the parties, to their messages. One easy and simple way of computing multi-party sorting is to evaluate a sorting network. This is a sorting network proposed by Batcher. And each of these yellow uh, boxes, they, 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 are, they correspond to a quorum, a set of logarithmic number of parties. And they are called, comp they are called comparator. So if they, they just swap their values based, the inputs based on their values and very, very simple building blocks that can be implemented with very, very small number of multiplications. Each of these comparators only need five multiplications. So we use our idea, our MPC idea, to evaluate this circuit over the inputs of all parties. And since the problem of anonymous broadcast is reduced to multi-party sorting, this, the problem of anonymous broadcast is solved. We perform some micro benchmarks to see how this algorithm works to get an estimation of the cost that we will see in practice. Uh, the x-axis here is the log, log of number of parties, and the y-axis is the log of number of kilobytes sent. And this is per party, per sorted element. So each party, because in, in, in usual MPC, the output of computation is not a vector. It's just a value, like this at sum of all the inputs. However, in sorting, each of the parties are receiving the entire vector. So we decided actually to, to see what is the cost per sorted element. And you see, for example, for 2 to the 25th parties, which is about 33 million parties, each party only sends 5 kilobytes of data to receive one sorted element. And in, as a conclusion, we, I, I, we proposed an efficient protocol for MPC that tolerates up to a tenth fraction of malicious parties. And we built an, an efficient anonymous broadcast protocol based on that, based on multi-party sorting. This MPS has application in other um, systems, like, for example, intrusion detection systems that a, a, a massive piece of data, which is the logs of the network, uh, the IDS system wants to sort them to make some decisions that which part of the system is under attack. And this multi-party sorting will help to sort that giant piece of data. Gigabytes of data are usually needed to be sorted in, in a secure way by a, a set of very large parties. A number of open problems remain. One of the first one which we are going to consider is to blacklist bad parties over time. This will definitely give us a great amortized cost over time. And the asynchronous communication currently, uh, Manoush, one of our teammates, uh, she's going to, tomorrow to talk about her own uh, asynchronous communication protocol. We're going to use their ideas 
and uh, they, they, they propose a T-counter, a very interesting data structure, and we're going to use that in our protocol to adopt to the asynchronous setting. And also the adaptive adversary will be, would be a, a more realistic type of adversary. Thank you, and thanks for listening. Is there any questions? <laughs> Yes, it's a simulation. It's not a real implementation. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was okay. So there are parts of our algorithm that we implemented. For example, we use the implementation of Shai Halevi and Victor Show for FHE. For and then we we multiplied in it, it, as a micro, micro benchmark. We multiplied the cost of FHE to the number of times that we use that in our protocol. So we. We, we conducted some experiments on building the building blocks, the implementations of the building blocks, and then tried to estimate how much cost our algorithm has. What about the threshold FHE? Yes, that's a threshold FHE. But their the implementation is not threshold FHE, right? Our implementation is. Because you extended the FHE implementation? Exactly. And it's very easy. Uh, the, the TFHE scheme of Asherov is, is uh, based on BGV. And the imp current implementation that Shai Halevi and Victor Shup has have uh, is based on BGV. So, and, and some other optimizations that they they've done. Uh, the decryption algorithm that they proposed, which is a threshold decryption, the encryption scheme is exactly the same as BGV. However, the key generation is a threshold key generation because the set of parties want to have a joint secret key. And the uh, decryption algorithm is uh, a threshold scheme that uh, up, no uh, subset of less than a third fra fraction of parties can uh, decrypt the message uh, by their own. They have to be more than a third fraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, can you comment on how many rounds does your broadcast, anonymous broadcast, how many rounds does it? The round complexity of our algorithm is O of D, where D is the depth of the, the circuit. And in the anonymous broadcast, the depth of that circuit, the batcher's net sorting network, is log squared n. So we send log, uh, and it's not O of log, it's the actual cost is log squared n. So if you have n parties, you need to sort. So for example, here, the. If, if you raise this 25 to 2, you get 625, which is the number of rounds that our algorithm, that our anonymous broadcast <coughs> requires for 2 to the 25th number of parties. Yes? Okay. So um, it seems that you're doing uh, sorting to do a shuffle. Would it be more? Uh, I would thought, think that it would be easier just to do the shuffle directly. Uh, I think shuffling is similar to the sorting thing because once each party chooses a random number, then and they, they sort. I think it can be shown that these two are. This, this is just like shuffling. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the goal, right? As far as I see it. Yes. I think the reason. Would be more efficient. Yeah, fast okay. Fast okay, that, that's a good thing. Thanks for saying that. But uh, I don't know if we have a, a good shuffling circuit that we can do MPC. Because for sorting, that was quite easy. Each of these comparator gates are just, um, they're, they're doing five multiplications to compare two values. But. There are permutation networks that do essentially shuffling, and they have, I think, smaller depth. That, for example, is one. That would be a good thing to consider. Thanks. Okay. Last question. Yeah, so uh, I did not get how you got this bound of n by, uh, n by 9 or n by 10, because most of the primitive that you showed seems to be working for honest majority or? Uh, yes. The reason that this, uh, the entire fraction is n over 10, however, the fraction inside one curve is n over 9, is that the, for each party, for each quorum, the quorum building algorithm gives us a bound of a third fraction of bad parties. However, if you look at this page, yeah, here. For the proof of security, the number of bad parties in each quorum is n over 3. And n over 3 again here. 
So in order to handle collision, because resharing is done once for each adjacent uh, gate. So a third here and a third here. So if these two a third parties get together to do a coalition attack, then our algorithm, the security will be broken. So we need a, a, a number of bad parties in each, which is a ninth. So if they get there together, we get a, a, a ninth plus a ninth and plus a ninth for this gate because each gate has two inputs. A, nine, a third, a third, and a third. So and if you multiply them, you get a ninth fraction. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.